Okay, well, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is Mike Schwartz. I'm the program director here at Fluxian Biosciences, and I'm joined by our two other speakers today, Christian Ionescu Zanetti, our CPO, and, and also Christopher Davies, the director of bioinformatics at Thermo Fisher Scientific on the Ion, uh, Ion Torrent product team. So the main focus of this webinar is to highlight a new workflow for cancer biomarker analysis using a blood biopsy approach. And we're going to talk about the isoflux system and how it achieves the CTC recovery and purity necessary to meet the demands of routine next-gen sequencing workflows. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the challenges and opportunities for blood-based biomarker detection in oncology. And then I'll hand the presentation over to Chris, who's going to talk about the AmpliSeq technology and the NGS workflow that goes along with that. And then Christian's going to close out by talking about some of the analytical validation that we've done on this workflow, and also one of the representative clinical studies that we've done using the NGS assay. So just a quick disclaimer, uh, the Isoflux system is listed as a class one device with the US FDA but all of the kits and applications discussed in this webinar are considered for research use only. Most people feel that blood biopsies are going to make the first clinical impact for oncology in the management of the disease uh, after the diagnosis point. Um, here, critical decisions need to be made throughout the course of the disease, and having timely access to this diagnostic information is very critical. And today, most of these decisions are made based on imaging studies, tumor histology, and there are a few blood markers, but um, none that really drive at the somatic variants that might be present in the tumor. Um, in the past decade, molecular profiling of the primary tumor tissue has become increasingly prevalent. But as we come to learn more about this disease, uh, it's quite clear that there's an evolution going on over time. And then just having a single snapshot, however comprehensive it is, really can't adequately uh, represent this evolution. And so this quickly moves the bottleneck of the process to getting access to tissue. Uh, biopsies and needle aspirates uh, are typically, they're only collected once at the time of diagnosis, uh, and sometimes not at all if the tumor is difficult to access or if the patient simply cannot endure the, the surgical procedure. So blood biopsies offer the potential to track a range of different cancer biomarkers at all the critical inflection points of disease management. So here's a common example of the standard of care for non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, patients are diagnosed and staged with, uh, you know, the standard workup of imaging and histology tests, and then typically moved to surgery and or a frontline chemotherapy uh, or perhaps a targeted agent up front. But over a relatively short time frame, most of these patients are going to fail on their directed therapy. So after this point of initial failure, the clinician and patient are both in need of more timely information to really help focus on the next rounds of treatment. Blood biopsies can help do this uh, by uncovering emerging or resistance mutations that um, might have associated uh, drugs that can help treat them, whether they're approved or um, in clinical trials. This one example, um, one study has shown that, you know, PIK3CA mutations have popped up at around 5% of patients uh, that are, have already been um, classified as EGFR positive, um, and there's already several agents on trial that can address this new, uh, well, this particular mutation that might not have been detected otherwise. So this really plays to the um, potential use cases for blood-based biopsies. So I think we're all probably familiar with the range of analytical technologies that can be used for cancer biomarkers. Um, and it's no secret that NGS really is at the forefront of this development right now, um, both in the clinic and in uh, translational studies. Um, and I think the reason this has really taken off is just how much potential it holds for really all the key stakeholders in oncology management. NGS has with it a multiplexing capability to assay for thousands of potential mutations at a time. So clearly this can serve as both a discovery and a tracking tool in translational studies. 
for pharma and biotech companies, this can help identify patients that are going to respond best to drugs that are still on clinical trial, um, and especially as these pathways uh, that the drugs target become more focused, uh, it's, it's going to be more important to have a wider range of targets that are being tracked over time. For the diagnostic labs, you know, the one thing we hear most often is that NGS provides a foundational platform and it can share essentially a single validation that yield tests for many different indications. So this really lowers the, the, the burden for clinical labs to have tests that can track um, any number of solid tumor indications. So ultimately, the combination of improved test coverage and streamlined logistics are going to bring these benefits directly to the patients and the healthcare system. So in the field of NGS, um, whole genome screening gets a lot of the attention for just the sheer power of looking across the entire genome. Um, but we all know this comes at a high expense and effort. Whole exome sequencing is a slightly more manageable look at just the protein coding regions. But I think at this point, most people still feel this is a bit much for the routine usage for clinical and research labs, uh, particularly if we're talking about tracking patients uh, multiple time points uh, throughout the year uh, and throughout the course of disease. Targeted panels can focus on anywhere from 10 to 500 genes, um, covering thousands of mutations that are most associated with solid tumors. So while all of these approaches have a place in cancer management, um, the workflow that we've initially chosen to focus on is the targeted panel approach. And as the testing moves closer to the clinic and translational studies, um, targeted sequencing brings with it a very compelling profile of clinically relevant content along with speed and affordability. And this, re this is really what makes it suitable for routine usage in those labs. Our main goal with this workflow was to make it adoptable by any size lab using their existing NGS infrastructure and reagents. And in order for this to be possible, the assay has to comply with the typical performance specs of these platforms. The AmpliSeq technology that Chris is going to talk about next uh, is somewhat unique in that it can work with as little as 10 nanograms or lower starting input material. Um, other targeted panels are going to typically require anywhere from 50 to a few hundred nanograms of DNA input. Uh, targeted panels often run anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 read depth to ensure uh, adequate sensitivity, uh, particularly at the lower uh, mutant allele frequencies. But this can usually be done in a, a multiplex format to keep uh, the cost and the time manageable. And the normal range of detection goes down to about uh, anywhere in the 1% to 5% range, which means that for a blood biopsy, you need the starting sample to be at least in the 5 to 10% or greater uh, tumor content range uh, to allow for some uh, accommodations for heterozygous mutations as well as uh, subclonal distribution. So right now, there's maybe two main approaches to blood biopsies, um, circulating tumor cells and cell-free DNA. Um, both of these have levels of tumor DNA that previously were, were considered below the detection limits of most technologies. Um, both of these approaches have a considerable wild-type background uh, initially, either white blood cells or just wild-type DNA fragments in the case of cell-free DNA. And, and right now, both of these technologies are currently, currently being played out in both the research and the diagnostic setting. And I think most people feel that ultimately, both of these technologies are going to have a place in the clinic. And, and this is because there's trade-offs between the two technologies. And you know, each, each approach might shine in a different clinical application. Um, right now, uh, most people that are using CFDNA are primarily using it to track small groups of known mutations, typically ones that are identified from the biopsy. Um, the main analytical technologies for detection um, are typically either qPCR or digital PCR 
although some sequencing approaches, uh, particularly with uh, deep breed coverage, can be used. Um, CTCs can be enriched using technologies like Isoflux, which means that you can run, you can get the purity up a bit higher, uh, more consistently, and so you can start using standard NGS panels and tracking uh, a wider variety of mutations or identifying new mutations over the course of disease. But, uh, but both of these approaches have some common challenges, and these are things that we will address uh, throughout the remainder of this presentation. Um, in general, the challenges are that it's tough to get um, enough tumor material you know, out of the sample, um, and having it at a high enough purity where the detection technologies can pick it up. Um, then there's also concerns about the, the quality of the DNA. Um, particularly if it's fragmented um, or has been kind of chewed up in the circulation, uh, which is another reason why we favor taking the DNA out of the, the live circulating cells, just to potentially get a higher quality DNA isolation. And then there's always the question of, you know, where is the DNA coming from? Um, from the live circulating tumor cells, it seems clear that that's where it's coming from. Um, uh, the cell-free DNA is coming from uh, it's typically apoptotic fragments that are released into the circulation, but we know that this can vary dynamically with uh, stage of disease as well as uh, you know, relative to the timing of therapy. Cell-free DNA uh, is typically collected and purified from fresh plasma followed by analysis using one of the detection technologies that I just mentioned. Um, there's no real standard way of doing this in individual labs other than perhaps the uh, purification method. There are a few diagnostic companies and service providers that have started to offer this as a service, but typically they need to offer very high sensitivity uh, going down below 0.1%. And again, they're focusing typically on very small groups of individual mutations on the order of 10 to 100. Some of the challenges with uh, cell-free DNA that have been pointed out in the literature are that the, there's comparatively higher sensitivities needed, which this directly impacts the, the resources that are required to detect these. And so it can make it difficult to implement this for routine clinical screening. It's also been observed that earlier stage and non-metastatic patients have far less tumor DNA available from the circulation. And this may push the general approach uh, further down in the course of disease you know, towards a point where curative options are not on the table. CTC approaches are gonna start with the same blood draw, but instead of separating the plasma, the CTCs are typically enriched either based on surface markers or the size or morphological properties of the cells. The, the first generation of CTC technologies, uh, including the cell search system and filter-based platforms, um, they really struggled to produce CTCs at the right level of recovery and purity for routine NGS usage. There's a recent paper out from Sarah Dawson's group showing that only about 37% of metastatic breast cancer patients had more than five CTCs, um, and these likely had very high white blood cell backgrounds, although this is not usually reported. So even in, you know, a late stage metastatic setting, there's just not going to be a lot of samples from the, the first generation of CTC technologies that can be um, taken through a routine NGS workflow. So that's why we developed the Isoflux system here at Fluxion. Um, the goal was to um, get a high quality CTC recovery that can be used directly for molecular profiling. So I'll just briefly recap the details of our platform in case you're not familiar with it. Um, this is an immunomagnetic cell enrichment instrument that uses combinations of antibodies bound to magnetic beads to pull out CTCs from the blood. And it utilizes a microfluidic cartridge that increases the sensitivity and the purity of CTC recovery. So here you can see the cartridge with a close-up of the microfluidic channels. Um, as far as the workflow, 
the red blood cells are first removed using Cycol, and then it's mixed with the antibody labeled beads. And this gets loaded into the sample input that you can see here to the left, and then loaded inside the instrument. Once inside the instrument, the samples flow through an isolation zone where there's a high strength magnet that pulls out all of the bead labeled cells and all the remaining white blood cells flow past into the waste well. So the resulting product is a small volume micro droplet of enriched tumor cells ready for analysis. Fluxian currently offers several different kits to tailor the antibody capture to the specific application. Um, we've developed protocols that incorporate both epithelial and disease markers, including things like EMT markers that can be read, readily implemented in your own laboratories. Um, and then our customers have also developed their own capture cocktails for doing um, things like you know, melanoma cells, uh, T cell receptors, and specific drug targets in the case of our pharma and biotech customers. So just as one example of this, um, here you're seeing three different cell lines, um, BT549, MBA, MB231, and SKBR3. Um, each of them stain for three different antibodies that we frequently use for capture. FCAM and EGFR as epithelial markers, and HER2 as a more disease-specific marker. So you can see at the bottom the BT549 cell line has extremely low EPCAM expression, basically undetectable using immunofluorescence uh, and moderate EGFR expression. So here we see that even just using EPCAM, there's about 45% cell recovery. And I think this really speaks to the sensitivity of the platform because this is basically undetectable as far as EPCAM expression. So when we include the full antibody cocktail, it boosts its recovery up to about 75%. So it's clear that these cocktails can be a very advantageous strategy to include in any kind of CPC recovery because the more cells, particularly the more cells that are relevant to the disease, um, you know, it's going to only improve your odds going into the, the next gen sequencing workflow. So we've started to roll this into um, our ongoing clinical studies. Um, here you're seeing a mix of um, mix of samples here from kidney, colorectal cancer, pancreatic, and prostate patients. Um, and what we've seen so far is that the median CTC count has gone up to around 71 CTCs, uh, which is well above the levels that we typically see using EPCAM alone, more in like the 20 to 30 cell range. And so again, having extra CTCs, particularly if they're captured with antibodies that are believed to be targeting cells that are of most relevance, um, you know, is only going to boost the odds going into the, the next gen workflow. So one of the new kits that we launched this year to support the next gen sequencing application is called the Isoflux NGS DNA kit. This is one of the first products of its kind to deliver CTCs at purities um, above 5% for the majority of patients. And so this makes it realistic to do routine NGS on these samples. Um, the kit has two different parts. The first is a purity enhancement column that depletes um, excess white blood cells that are carried over. And then the second part is a whole genome amplification reagent that works directly with the, the purity enhancement column. And it's based on the widely accepted Replogy technology that we've licensed from Kyogen. So in our initial testing, um, and again, this is across a variety of different solid tumor indications, we see that about 80% of the samples had a tumor purity greater than 5%. So this is a critical link between the isoflux system and the next-gen sequencing workflow because it produces amplified DNA that can be stored um, indefinitely at minus 20 and then taken into the sequencing workflow either on site or at a remote location. Okay, so just to recap the workflow here and finish my section, um, we're starting with a whole blood sample. We can use anywhere from 7 to 15 mils of whole blood. We use antibody cocktails to enhance the capture. These can be ones that we provide or these can be ones that are user-defined and sourced on your own. 
the Isoflux instrument produces a focus cell pellet that goes into the Isoflux NGS kit. It goes through purity enhancement and amplification, and then it's ready for sequencing. And I'll just tee things up for Chris by kind of reviewing the sequencing workflow. Um, you know, the, the DNA is first going to go into target enrichment, where the, um, the targeted amplicons are enriched uh, on the cancer panel. And then it goes to the standard next-gen sequencing, uh, library preparation, templating, and then barcoding if you plan to put multiple samples on the chip. Um, in this case, we're sequencing on the ion torrent PGM using the 318 version 2 chip. And then Chris and Christian are both going to talk a little bit about our data analysis pipeline that, um, that we've developed, but it can be readily, readily implemented um, on your own workstations using a, a cloud-based solution. So I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Chris, who's going to go into more detail on the AmpliSeq workflow. And just give us a sec here to, to transfer over. Hello, everyone. This is Chris. Christian is transferring the uh, control of the webinar to his computer so we can carry on in a second. Okay, he's showing his screen. Hi. I assume everybody can see the screen now. Let us know via the comments if you cannot. Okay, so I'm going to describe this um, the ion torrent, thermal pressure ion torrent AmpliSeq platform as it was used here using our research use CHP2 panel, which is a cancer hotspot panel, and uh, on a, a spike in study of MDA and B231 cells spiked into normal whole blood. Okay, so this is a sort of a research use uh, application here. Um, so, top left corner of the slide here, you see that we, we can start off with 10 nanograms of DNA, and that gets amplified using the AmpliSeq ion, AmpliSeq primer pool. In this case, it's a single pool solution um, that uses uh, 207 amplicons for the, the CHP2 panel. Um, the, so the target's amplified, and then the next step is to digest off the um, most of the primer sequences, leading to these shortened orange bits on the end of the amplicons there. Then we have the sequencing adapters. You can do that with or without barcoding. The barcoding allows you to multiplex multiple samples on a single chip. Then you go into library preparation, top right. Templates are prepped in their on their individual beads, so there should be a single clone of single molecule clone per bead. And then, whoops, hang on, back up. Then the uh, the sequencing takes place on the chip. And uh, Christian, thank you. Sequencing place takes place on the chip um, in the ion PGM sequencer. Okay. The complete workflow takes about 16 and a half hours, assuming we've got a four and a half hour run, run sequence. So it can be certainly done in a, a 24 hour turnaround time um, or in a more intensive shift based um, uh, you know, situation where you're cycling your lab people in um, and uh, you can get it done in, in, in a faster than that. And then click the next slide. Okay. So here's a description of the ion amplitude panel. This is the cancer hotspot panel V2. Um, it, is, it targets 50 genes and about 2,800 cosmic mutations in those 50 cancer genes. Um, there are 207 amplicons overall of average length, 154 base pairs that um, target those 50 genes and 2,800 mutations. The list of the genes on the right. The amplicon sizes um, vary from about 90 through 190. The actual, um, the average is 154. Um, the, ma the vast majority are in the 125 to 175 base pair range. Next. 
Um, runtime varies for the different types of chips that you can use and the different types of read length kits. Obviously, the, the longer read length kits take more time and the, uh, the higher density chips take a little longer as well. But using the, the, you know, the, your best bang for the buck chip, the ION318 chip V2 here, you can see that the runtime is 7.3 hours for about 5 million reads or four and a half hours if you're just doing the 200 base kit, which would be all you need for the CHP2 panel. Okay, so here's the actual mock CTC experimental design. MDA, MD231 cells were spiked into normal whole research blood. And this simulates a, um, a CTC count of three to 23 cells per mil in, in that blood. Then, and this is done triplicate, and the samples are taken through the isoflux capture system. Okay, then one of the sam one of those uh, sam one of those triplicates is taken to a, um, a visual counting step in the top right corner to to estimate the recovery rate. And you can see that our CDC recovery rates in this experiment were 53 to 72 percent, with a purity estimated purity of between five and 22 percent. Okay, then the other two, the other two of uh, samples from the from that triplicate are uh, amplified with the uh, Replicate kit from Kyogen, and then taken through the uh, amplifiet amplification process and run on PGM. I think these three aging chips for this. Okay, bottom left corner, we, we followed four specific mutations that we knew were present in the MDA cells, but not in the background uh, um, PBMCs. And three of these are semantic mutations from, from MDA. One of them is a germline mutation that happens to be present in MDA. That's the green one, the green box. Um, but nevertheless, a followable mutation that's in the MDA, but not the background. Um, we looked at all of these using the next slide here, CAS PCR assay to confirm that KRAS was uh, present in all of those samples and indeed it was. Okay. Now you'll notice also that some of these mutations are heterozygous and some are homozygous. T P fifty three appears to be homozygous and probably homozygous diploid. But heterozygous mutations that appear to be coming in as triploids. So sometimes in, in, in MDA 231, you can see a 33% allele ratio or 66% allele ratio. And that's because, as you see on the next slide, these MDA cells, the cell line is fairly, um, it's got a fairly uh, pseudo triploid carrier type. It's, it's, it's rather messed up. Most chromosomes are there as triploid. And so it's really a, uh, look at the draw whether your whether your hat is a 50% of the ratio or 33% or, or 66%. Okay. Mm. Here is a um, uh, output from the torrent suite showing the showing the PGM run metrics for in this case a 10 flex uh, run where we got a mean read depth of about just a little over 2,000 reads per um, amplicon. Typically, we run, uh, I think in the Fluxion system, they prefer to run like six flex and get, get about a 4,000 read depth. But for this particular run, you can see that there's, a, there's an image top left that shows how, where, which beads on the chip are active. The redder one, you know, the redder it gets, just the higher density um, areas where the sequence is being collected from. Um, there's a, there's a, a summary there showing that we've got 73% low loading in the middle top. 65% um, of them are clone, also useful, and so. And then in the end, you have 91% uh, final library useful, giving us four points, almost 4.9 million reads. Okay, read length in the top right there is exactly what we'd expect. Um, middle bottom, we're showing that most of it aligns to the human genome, which is which is exactly what you expect as well. There's a, a quality, a raw accuracy plot there showing the accuracy dropping off a little bit right towards the end of the kit as expected. And yeah, some stats down the bottom. That's on a per, per barcoded sample basis. So 
we've got a mean depth of about 92%, more than 96% or so on, on target, 500,000 reads approximately per sample, and our uniformity is 99.1%. And uniformity is defined by, um, it, it means that um, greater than 99% of our amplicons are greater than 0.2x of the mean amplicon uh, read depth. So that means that there's only about 1% that's less than 0.2x of mean and a, a really too low depth to, to call sensitive uh, mutations or polymorphisms on. So uniformity is a good thing to for. So using our default somatic detection variant calling, which is really tuned to, the, to, to detect down to about 5%, we find that we really don't see all of these, um, these spiked in mutations down below well, down below 15%, there's some dropout even. And so at the top right-hand corner here, you can see that the 15% the, the samples uh, have, one of them has all three mutations detected. One of them only has two detected. It's missing the, the uh, KRAS detection. Um, and it's missing PGFRA. We expect to get four mutations for each sample. So there's basically a lot of dropout going on here because we, we haven't seen the parameters yet. So we then did indeed tune the parameters to see to see lower percentage allele ratios. And the, the parameters are, that, um, that are tuned are the ones that are in either, well, in blue here in this uh, table on the left. Uh, those that start out started out as green are ones where we're increasing the um, the quality. So we're doing more stringent filtering now on the individual reads before we make the call. And the ones in red or going from red are where we and including the one at the bottom where we go from 0.03 to 0.006 in three base pass. Those are the ones where we're increasing the sensitivity. Okay, so increasing sensitivity even though you're increasing quality at the um, at the variant calling step necessarily leads to more positives called, especially at, low, at those lower frequencies. And so we have a, a filtering that we do after the variant caller on the right hand side there, a quality filter, which it filters out reads that are less than 20x coverage for the alternate allele. And we're requiring a p value of less than 0 0.0006. And we're, we're only keeping. Um, mutations that are that have a holy homo polymer length next to them of five or more. Above six for this application six and above for this application proves to be a bit too inaccurate we feel. And then we also trim the ends of the bed files, but we, we have trimmed the ed edges of the bed file by four bases on each side. And this gets rid of some low frequency primer associated artifacts that can occur in the first couple of bases of a read sometimes. So that we're just making we're just making we're robustifying the system a little bit there for this this application. Okay, so after we apply the enhanced variant caller parameters, this is what we get. You can see that in almost all of the samples that have MDA cell spike into them, we see the um, the four mutations at pretty much the expected frequencies. There is one sample, I have a mouse, guess not. There's one sample, one of the 8% samples that doesn't detect TP53. And that one we, see, we think is uh, an, an issue with the WGH. Event. That sample simply did not, for some reason, amplify, w, amplify in the WGA step the TP53 gene. So just, there's just zero reads there. When you look at the actual reads in the IGV browser, there's, just, there's no, um, none of the alternate alleles are there from the spike in cells. Um, notice that in general, the TP53 TP mutation, which is the one that's there, homozygous, not HET, is present at higher frequencies than the others. That's expected. Um, there's yeah, and in general, you're seeing low frequencies down to the right as expected. So when we add all that up and, and plot for sensitivity in PPV, we see that we actually get 97% sensitivity down to our, our, our low threshold set at 
and we get 97% PPV also at that, at that low threshold. Um, in this case, in this study, we had there was one false negative which affected our sensitivity. That was the one TB53 one, which we think was not a not an isoflux or a sequencing issue, but rather a, probably a WGH issue. And the uh, the PPV was affected by one false positive at the one percent level, which only showed up in multiple references to one sample, and we think was actually a, a contaminant in that sample. So we think that the, the sequencing was correct in calling that false positive an actual fact. The study was done from the same WGA samples at two different sites, at, at UCSF and at the Einstein SSF site, that is the, the Thermo Fisher site in SSF. And we saw a concordance in the uh, allele frequencies of 0.95 between those two sites, so quite pleased with that. And indeed, the, the same false positive and same false negative from the WGA samples were present on the two sites as well, so extra evidence there. And so, just to conclude, yeah, 97% sensitivity, which is positive down to 1%, with 97% PPV. And it shows that, you know, it's a demonstration study showing that uh, low frequency variants can be detected in, at least in this demo, which is, uh, of course, um, cell line cells spiked into research normal whole blood. I think this is where I pass it off to Christian. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Christian Munich and I'll talk a little bit about um, how we've enabled uh, the adoption of this assay at various sites and, and uh, how we go about uh, transferring these protocols out. And um, I just wanted to remind you that if questions come up along the way, um, you should feel free to write them down in the questions section. And we won't address them during the talk, but we will um, do our best to address um, some or all of those questions at the end of the talk. Um, we've um, started uh, adopting this analytical system that uh, Chris was talking about in order to enable um, the analytical validation of the protocol at uh, different reference labs. And, and this really comes as a, um, this is a great help for bringing uh, different sites up to speed and just uh, making sure that everything is working right from the running of the NGS all the way through uh, to the bioinformatics pipeline. So what we typically do is we've stuck with this model where we spike in these mesenchymal-like MDA MB231 tumor cells. Uh, the reason this is a great model is these are uh, cell lines that this particular cell line is a breast cancer-derived cell line and it has very low FCAM expression, and so it does well to highlight our uh, recovery using the uh, FCAM EGFR cocktail. Okay. What we typically do then we, is that uh, we uh, blind the samples and mm -hmm. we transfer all of the uh, analysis over to yep. uh, our customers or collaborators, and this this whole analysis can be completed in the Ion Reporter online tool that's provided by Life Technologies. Um, finally, what we want to see is that these cell line variants can be detected all the way down to a recovered level of yeah. two cells per one milliliter of blood. Um, what that translates yeah. to in a traditional draw of seven mm -hmm. mils is, is uh, 14 cells that are being recovered, or in a larger yeah. draw of 14 mils, uh, that's cool. about uh, 28 cells. So we've done this a lot, and we've collected validation data and, and successfully uh, been able to complete this at over six sites. So just to review, uh, we have this cell line. This is well known uh, for these at least three somatic mutations that we focused on here, uh, the DRAF, the KRAF, and the TP53. And, and here I'm just showing the listing of these in the Cosmic Cell Lines Project database. So. Basically, what we do is we, we transfer over the protocols for both variant calling, yeah. so the, the parameter settings that Chris was talking about are yeah. transferred over as a custom JSON file. And after that, we also have a detailed protocol yep. that enables any user to put in yes. the uh, filtering parameters that we use in Iron Reporter yeah. to filter, then filter down 
the anything that's detected to the high confidence variance. So this is again an example of a dual data set that's similar to what Chris was showing and it shows data at two different sites. So again, here what we did is we had a cell count based on pre-labeled cells and that uh, estimates the purity of the cells. Um, you see data for the pure cell line at the top, it's about 5,000 cells and you clearly see the presence of these three mutations to our roughly heterozygous, one is homozygous and TP53. Um, then what we do is we perform blended analysis of these samples and call basically all the mutants that pass our, uh, our validation criteria. And these are the results that we get. Now, um, you can see that we go all the way from 12 cells per mil, and these are cells recovered down to two cells per mil, and that's the equivalent of a purity of 5%. So you roughly have a couple of hundred white blood cells in the background. The reason we're focusing on this 5% uh, number, again, is because as Mike showed earlier, we uh, looked at the purity enhancement and, and one of our critical parameters was to get all of the patients uh, above that 5% um, uh, purity number, the people that were CDC positive. Now, you might want to ask, if you always get 5% um, purity in a, in a majority of cases, um, why do you need to do variant calling down to 1% you know, or, or lower levels? And the answer there is that in the, the clinical samples, you're also dealing with heterogeneity among the circulating tumor cells. So you really want to be um, below 5%. You want to be able to call at least down to 1% uh, and more helpfully down to 0.5%, which, which we've also done but was not shown in this presentation. So the bottom line for this data set is you've got um, three matched samples, basically, and then the DNA is being the amplified DNA is being, again, analyzed at two different sites. You, you notice that there's not perfect overlap. Uh, one site was a single run, that's the site, site two here, and one, one site was, uh, I'm showing a combination of two different runs. Uh, we just used this to have more controls. We had the absolute positive control in there, as well as a number of different uh, negative controls, not just the zero spike level, but uh, uh, PBMC sample um, that just has white blood cells and, and two normal GDNA samples. So again, everything, every sample here is basically a control. Um, a lot of them, the, the spikins are positive controls in a way, but they're also negative controls because we're looking at the false positives that are not in the cell line, and they're not germline mutations in the donor blood. And so what you see is a very low false positive rate. And as Chris was showing previously, you have just this one uh, variant that's being detected here in the VHL gene. And basically, this is, this is just a wild type mutation, but also it's present in all of these samples. You see that there's one sample where it's not reported. Uh, that's because it, it failed one of our criteria for read number. We call anything that has over 20 reads on the variant allele, and that, that failed that particular parameter. But uh, upon deeper analysis, the variant is here as well. So it's, it's really present in, in the DNA, and it's probably also uh, an artifact of either the amplification or the um, targeted amplification. Also, you have a loss of one variant here, the TP53, and again, the, the, the same sample on both sides. So there's a very good correlation. Um, there is there is some um, small, low percent loss, um, likely due to the WJ process, but overall this works really well. And this whole pipeline means that you can do the NOVA detection with good confidence levels. And we've, uh, as I as I talked about on the previous slide, we've completed this type of analysis at about a half dozen different sites uh, up to now, and and it's uh, worked very well. So it's we, we really focused on making this a readily adaptable workflow, and we've honed in our, our validation criteria. Um, for the rest of the talk, I wanted to talk, talk about a representative clinical study. I, I think this is um, emerging data that's, also, that's looking at some ways that one might use both the enumeration functions of the system as well as, more importantly, the, the sequencing functions.
and it's it's done with a real uh, clinical research mindset in, in mind. So this particular example, the, the researcher at the University of Michigan, Dr. Ajay Alva, is focused on bladder cancer. And in bladder cancer, you have uh, a typical course of treatment consists of new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery, uh, cystectomy at the end of three cycles of chemo. Now, the idea behind um, administering chemo before surgery is that you would want to shrink the tumor and make it more operable and lead to um, higher success rates down the line for the patient. Now, at cystectomy, you receive a very accurate staging that's based on uh, surgery pathology that's called uh, P-stage, and that looks at the tumor invasion, that's um, the T-staging, that's T0, T1, or uh, T T1 through T4, you also uh, look at nodal staging, so um, whether or not there's nodal involvement. So that can be either an N0 for no nodal involvement or an N1 for nodal involvement. Uh, we are collecting samples before the first cycle of therapy, so all these are new adjuvant samples, as well as before the second cycle of therapy. And the long-term goal here is to try to correlate these counts to the responsiveness of these patients and the ultimate outcome post-chemo. It's known that the P-stage is associated with uh, risk of, of recurrence. So just a little bit about the enumeration results, um, uh, rather the, the validation of the enumeration assay before I go into the results themselves. So what we did first was we had a first cohort of patients where we just looked at repeatability and did count for 2A versus 2B, basically two draws uh, done at the same time at um, either the initial uh, before cycle one or post cycle one time points. And what we did here, and by the way, this is a log graphic that you can see uh, on the left here going from one CDC on the bottom, 10 here at, at the center, and then 100. And we divided these counts into three different buckets. A low CTC count below 10 cells, um, we felt that that was pretty safe in order to not report any false positives. Our, our negative controls were all below this, this threshold, well below this threshold. We had a medium uh, level from 10 to 50, and, and then a high level that, that was uh, above uh, 50 CTCs. And what's um, good about this is you see the level of difference that's typical between matched tubes. You have some zero counts followed by a positive count that's very low. I think this is two cells in this case. And then you have um, for the, you have a very good agreement between most of these measurements. And once you take into account these buckets, there's actually 100% agreement uh, between all the measurements that were taken in this cohort, meaning if 2A was in the low, CTC low bucket, so was 2B, um, same for CTC medium and high. Um, this is what the samples typically look like after isolation and uh, application of our uh, labels. So basically, um, just so you know, we use the typical uh, well-accepted um, definition of a circulating tumor cell, basically, we looked at three different markers. We looked at pancreatic pancreatin, uh, a CD45 marker for white blood cells, and a universal density marker that should highlight the nucleus. So the positive cells are shown in this first column. Uh, they are uh, they have a visible nucleus. They're clearly uh, CK positive, so those were counted as uh, CTCs. On the on the right, you see white blood cells. They're typically smaller in size, and they have. They're also. Uh, you can you can see a nucleus, and you can see the CD45 stain indicating that they're white white blood cells. Okay, now we looked at uh, correlations pre-post chemotherapy, and looking that in terms of, uh, and we uh, we bucketed those patients based on the um, the staging. We, have all, we also looked at the healthy cohorts, and as I told you, uh, all of those were in the CTC low category, as well as a metastatic uh, cohort. Um, those are patients from uh, collaborators at, at UCSF. 
basically the the lab of um, uh, Pamela Paris. So basically, um, what we see here is that for the neoadjuvant um, patients, you see what's expected, which is that there is an increase in the number of people um, that go into the low CDC bucket after the first course of therapy. So um, these, if you're responding to the systemic therapy, you expect the number of intact cells in circulation to also go down, and, and that's what you see here. You also see a uh, matching decrease in the number of people that are in the CTC high bucket, and that's what you expect. Um, these are matched patients in the neoadjuvant baseline to follow up. The metastatic cohort is completely distinct from that, and we have basically a higher percentage of people in the high bucket, but these are, again, I should caution, these are not directly comparable because it's a, it's a different cohort of patients, but it's sort of what you expect. Uh, interestingly, in these patients, you also have a significant number in the in the low bucket, perhaps indicating that the, the therapy is working, and, and so these people are not presenting a lot of cells in, in the circulation. Now, what we did next was to um, plot these numbers according to the p-staging for uh, neoadjuvant patients only. So, on the left, you have the patients that were p-staged P0 and N0. Uh, indicating a, a low risk of recurrence. And then you had, um, on the right, you have P stage uh, either P1 and above or, or N, N1. And so I think uh, if you look at these graphs, um, you see some, some change from the first to the second time point, but um, you see there's a very clear difference between these two cohorts in terms of the, the cell numbers that were detected. So. There, there does well, seem to be I some like correlation that. between um, the staging at surgery and and, uh, and the counts that we get at these two time points. Now, um, the numbers are still low here for patients that we've analyzed, but we do see um, some correlations here. Uh, basically, we looked at the different measurements just to see what lines up best to P staging. So, uh, what I'd like to highlight here is that. The patients that were baseline medium high had uh, a very high probability of being P stage advanced, either T1 to 4 or N1 N1 2. Um, that means that these these people will be at, at higher risk, and potentially uh, in the future, uh, this larger studies will hopefully yield. Um, which patients are really responding and benefiting from, from chemo and which patients are not. Um, the other correlation that I'd like to point out again is if you have a medium to high CDC count at both baseline and at um, the second time point, and this is the, the bottom here, um, all the patients in this category were, were uh, advanced P-stage. So, Again, it's been shown that the CDCs are a, a good prognostic. I think what's uh, interesting about this study is that bladder cancer has been notoriously difficult to obtain cells from patients. And in this study, we show that you know, we, can, we can track patients. They're well differentiated from the healthy cohort. And there seems to be, a, 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 again, a, a decent correlation with P-staging. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk about the first set of sequencing data uh, from these patients. Again, when we start uh, running clinical samples uh, for this uh, clinical research project, we looked at um, both metastatic and neoadjuvant patients. And what we typically do is we run, in terms of the mechanics, we end up running six samples per 318 chip. And what that gives us is a mean coverage of about 4,000x while keeping costs reasonable. We typically have four patient samples per run as well as healthy and positive controls for each one. Yeah, that's right. That is basically, correct. Basically, the positive control also, um, also serves as a negative control in a way because what you'd want to see is the detection of these known um, known variants that are there that are somatic, but no no extraneous detection of other variants that come through, 
again, the healthies, uh, you want to see no variance detected at all. And what we did here is we did blended analysis for a subset of these. We did what we did for our analytical samples. That is, we processed the same amplified DNA at multiple sites. And those samples are indicated by an asterisk. So first of all, um, the controls look good, which is great. And what you see in the samples that were processed at multiple sites is that we had a great agreement in terms of being able to detect the same variants at both sites where they were tested. In terms of variant detection, we we uh, looked, we saw about 50% of patients having at least one variant. Uh, some of these were genes that are well known to be associated with this disease, like JAK2 and uh, FGFR2. So, in conclusion, uh, I think that uh, we've developed a readily available uh, workflow to look at uh, tumor cells via NGS that, that use the amplitude panels that are well validated and have a fairly good coverage over 50 genes. And really our, our collaborators and our customers are in kind of uh, two different areas. One is the genomic test lab within cancer centers. Uh, the, others, the other is uh, pharmaceutical companies that are, that are using the system as clinical trial support. So uh, obviously if you're a pharmaceutical company, what you're looking at is um, biomarker development and selection of patients, uh, as well as surrogate endpoints for, for clinical trials. Others are doing um, clinical, clinical uh, research and translational science, basically looking at um, either, uh, either what's, a, what's uh, present as a mutation in the sample as a whole or single cell studies. Um, I haven't talked about that, but there are workflows whereby one can select single tumor cells, amplify those, and, and sequence them in a similar manner. The other thing that is enabled by the system because the cells are intact is um, gene expression studies, either at the population level or at the single cell level, and uh, we've done some of that work as well, although it wasn't highlighted in this talk. Uh, again, I, I think in the future, the, the biggest promise of this is being able to uh, develop tests that are robust and that can provide uh, uh, window into the disease and, and the, the evolvement, evolving uh, mutational status of the patient, and that's what a lot of these studies are aimed at. Okay, so just to summarize, um, I believe that um, we've we've shown you that I think the blood biopsies are coming into their own. There are uh, different techniques that are aimed at uh, gleaning mutational information from these types of biopsies and the, the sequencing is becoming more and more, uh, it's being applied more and more to these sample types. We think it's the optimal technology and that's where we put a lot of effort into optimizing and being able to, to transfer and replicate this workflow. We've uh, recently introduced this um, NGS kit that achieves higher purity as we've shown, a majority of patients have greater than 5% tumor, tumor content, which is compatible with this type of assay. And uh, we've had a very, we've been very fortunate to work with Life Technologies in developing the Amplitude technology for this particular application. And you saw what was involved in that. It's basically uh, not as much the run of the assay, but there's been a lot of development on the bioinformatics side to increase the sensitivity without losing um, without losing specificity. So, so keeping uh, a very low false positive rate. And so, um, I'm hoping to see more great results from our collaborators and customers. And with that, uh, this concludes our, our webinar, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, this is uh, Mike again. I just want to thank everyone for attending and thank our speakers, uh, Chris Davies and Christian Ionescu Zanetti. And I've got a couple of questions here that I can start with uh, that were asked during the presentation. And then if you have any additional ones, you can type them in now.
Um, you can also email questions to us privately at support at fluxandbio.com. Uh, so I've got one question here uh, asking about the availability of this as a service. And I'm not sure if that's referring to the Isoflux portion or the NGS portion. Um, but yeah, so we, we uh, for those that don't know, we run a service lab um, at Fluxion where we can do both the targeted CTC enrichment. You can send clinical samples to our lab. We uh, can process them all the way through, including the next-gen sequencing. Um, you know, if your lab is not currently set up for next-gen sequencing, but you have the isoflux or are considering having the isoflux, um, you know, there's, there's never been a better time to get involved with sequencing. Uh, the PGM comes in at a very uh, reasonable price point. Um, but if you'd prefer to still send that out, uh, there's a number of service labs that just offer the NGS lab, and you probably would want to get in touch with us, and we can perhaps make some recommendations. Um, there was another question asking more about the controls that we use in the sequencing and how often you implement them. Um, so this really, you know, has a lot to do with the assay design. So, you know, your lab would ultimately make those calls. But in general, you know, like Christian talked about, um, there's an analytical validation involved when you're setting up a new assay. And we think that the, the spike in model running all the way through isoflux is good because it, um, it kind of challenges the entire process. Yeah. And, you know, for that we use tumor cell lines that have very well characterized uh, somatic variants that we can make sure that we see. Um, there are other commercial options out there. Um, I know within the Thermo Fisher portfolio, there's a, um, a line of control standards for NGS from Acrometrics that have, you know, anywhere from a small amount to a couple hundred variants that are reliably detected and kind of known titers. Um, these would also make very good uh, control materials as a, as a positive control. And then for us as a negative control, it would simply be uh, healthy donor you know, research blood obtained from, uh, you know, we have a commercial supplier, but there's also, you know, anywhere in the clinic they can typically draw healthy donor blood. And then as far as like how often to, to run them, um, we would typically include a positive control in every, in every run. Um, just as a fail safe, and then there'll probably be some inter intermittent use of both positive and negative controls um, on some kind of periodic basis. But this ultimately comes down to the, the assay design and how the analytical validation pans out. And then there's, there's one more question about doing the bioinformatic analysis. It sounds like this is coming from someone that doesn't have, uh, you know, a lot of previous experience with that. Um, there's a lot of different bioinformatic workflows and platforms that are out there, um, ranging from the very straightforward and simple to very powerful and complex. Um, if you're just getting started, we found that the Ion Reporter workflow uh, works very well. Um, for those that are kind of uninitiated in the space, the, the typical readout from sequencing is you know, raw sequencing reads that get aligned and put into a, something called a BAM file. And then if this is being done in kind of a centralized lab, like a core lab in your facility, they can output um, a set of suspected variants in a VCF format. And then th these can be analyzed directly on your own using a, a cloud-based solution like Ion Reporter, which simply means you go onto a website and apply the filters that we've prescribed and it'll take the kind of unfiltered variants and get you down to a, a final list of filtered variants that can be sent into annotation. So that's kind of the, the easiest entry point, but there are other uh, third-party packages out there for doing kind of more complex bioinformatic filtering. Hey, and then, hey, yeah, there was, there was another, yeah. There's another question for regarding uh, Chris's first, uh, segment of the talk about one of the graphs, and I'll let him address that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yes, the question was that there was a 
plot with an inset, and I believe that was actually there were two graphs, there were two slides like that. It's the I think it's those uh, colorful plots showing the allele ratios going down from 100% down to 0% for the four for the four mutations we were tracking, and the inset is simply a magnification of the of the same data for the 15% through 0% um, uh, uh, purity sample. So it's just a, a blow up, so you can more easily see what the actual allele ratio is in like those uh, lower lower frequencies. Hope that answers it. Thank you. Great. Then it looks like there was a question about uh, can we use other cell lines as controls besides MDA? Uh, and the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, we picked MDA for the reasons that Christian mentioned, but there are uh, infinite other cell lines out there from ATCC or other commercial suppliers that you can bring in. Um, so they can, they can be disease specific, you know, breast cancer cell lines like uh, MCF7, um, or they can represent other targets like a mesenchymal cell line. And then another common strategy that um, we're starting to employ is uh, mixing more than one cell line in the same positive control. So now you've you've covered different mutations across the genome um, just for more kind of diversity of your positive control and it'll just give you better fidelity of um, you know your your coverage on that particular run to make sure that uh, you're getting adequate representation across the entire targeted panel. You can also change the titration, so you can have something spiked in at high concentration, something at, you know, closer to the limit of detection or just above, so you can see, you know, kind of what the dynamic range of detection is looking like. It's okay, it's a... Uh, we're running a little bit over here, so I think we'll probably stop there. But again, if there's any other questions you'd like to ask, uh, you can send them to support at fluxionbio.com. So thanks everyone for attending, and uh, please stay tuned for future webinars.